Good morning. Uh, this is Dr. Nicholas Dogris, and uh, today we're going to have a discussion about uh, the effectiveness of electromagnetic stimulation, direct current stimulation, alternating current stimulation, random noise stimulation, and QEG. Uh, this is the presentation that I gave at the AAPP uh, uh, convention uh, just uh, last well, last week or two weeks ago in uh, Chicago. Um, as a uh, notice of uh, um, uh, to reduce conflict of interest here, uh, I am the co-founder and CEO of Neurofield Incorporated. I do have a fiduciary interest in the products that I will be discussing here in this presentation. Um, I am also a clinical psychologist and uh, I run a five room practice in Bishop, California. Let's see if I can get this thing to work for me here. There we go. Um, I've been very fortunate over the years um, to have been associated with many um, uh, neurofeedback practitioners that have had profound influence on me, um, namely uh, people like uh, Margaret Ayers, uh, who created the first patented neurofeedback device in the United States, um, Corey Hammond. Uh, Len Oaks, uh, Bob Thatcher, uh, Joel Lubar. Uh, there's a lot of people that um, have helped me to expand my knowledge and understand EEG and really uh, helped me in the development of, of what it is that we're doing now, how it all came together. So the question that I get quite a bit is um, what is Neurofield? How does this technology work? Um, what is the research behind it? Over the years um, um, we have developed a number of different um, devices and innovations and procedures with Neurofield. Um, the inspiration for me to develop this um, uh, occurred uh, in 2002 uh, after the birth of my son, who was born um, hypoxic and premature. Uh, up to that point in time, I had been working uh, in the neurofeedback field for many years, and um, I knew that um, the severity of damage that he sustained was such that um, there would be uh, a great deal of catch-up occurring in treating him if I waited until he was four or five years of age. Um, after his birth, um, I decided to wait and see how he would recover. And uh, when he reached about 18 months, he was only speaking about two words and he wasn't walking. And so at that point, um, I had been researching uh, various modalities and, and really digging into everything I could find. Um, and I came across transcranial magnetic stimulation. I was very interested in that because um, uh, TMS has the ability to really um, affect the brain very quickly and was shown to have a significant impact on people that suffered from depression. As I dug into the uh, TMS literature, I found that there was virtually no uh, procedures or devices that utilized um, um, very low intensity electromagnetic stimulation that was um, using alternating current or something that could um, give a, a what we call a linear stimulation um, so as to entrain the brain. And so uh, we began the process of uh, looking into um, low intensity stimulation with electromagnetics. And the, the idea was to give a stimulation that would um, not depolarize the neurons of the brain, but instead um, increase the, uh, uh, the current frequency that the brain was actually creating. 
And we tried a number of different techniques. Um, TMS is designed to give stimulations at either 10 hertz or 1 hertz. 10 hertz is considered excitatory, 1 hertz is considered inhibitory. Uh, the FDA has approved uh, TMS for treatment of depression, uh, uh, but basically they have said that it is a non-invasive form of treatment, which is very interesting because it does uh, really uh, reach in there and depolarize neurons. So um, we decided to make a very low intensity four channel frequency generator. Um, we've done um, three different um, uh, generations of our electromagnetic stimulation device. Um, and the uh, first one um, was able to give frequencies from 0.31 hertz all the way up to 100,000 hertz. Um, the intensity of the unit was one to three uh, milligauss. Um, and then we um, added, in, as we did more innervations, we ended up adding um, stronger coils and stronger system. And now the, the system um, can work anywhere from uh, uh, basically 1 to 50 microtesla. Um, and uh, it's still roughly uh, 40,000 times weaker than RTMS. Um, I know it says here it's in terms of 10, uh, 10 million times, and that was the original uh, uh, device uh, that I'm referring to. Uh, we've been at it for roughly 10 years now uh, in, in examining neurostimulation technology. Um, we've created a number of innovations, including um, uh, adding Z-score, uh, synchronized Z-score neurofeedback training to the uh, electromagnetic stimulation in 2011. Um, we created a 19-channel amplifier, a DC-coupled amplifier in 2013, and integrated it with uh, NeuroGuide, uh, BioExplorer, BioERA, uh, the Eager system. Um, so there's a number of different places that the Q20 can work. Um, we obtained our FDA registration in 2014. In 2015, we released our uh, direct current stimulation and alternating current uh, stimulation device, added it into the existing synchronized EMF and uh, EEG uh, stimulation uh, procedures. And then in 2016, we added uh, RNS, or random noise stimulation. Uh, for the last 14 months, uh, we've been writing a brand new uh, platform with we call uh, Neurofield 64, uh, which utilizes um, uh, more uh, stimulation devices and a wider uh, variety of, of treatment uh, procedures. Um, over the years, uh, we've been looking at different ways to use stimulation technology to uh, regulate the brain. Uh, we have found that um, if you can stimulate the brain prior to engaging in a neurofeedback or HEG uh, entrainment strategy, um, you can move a person quite quickly. And we have evidenced this through our QEEG maps and um, uh, the data that we've been collecting over the ten last 10 years. Uh, we've been getting better and better at it because the procedures now have a integrated EMF and um, a current stimulation um, combination that uh, is extremely uh, powerful. Um, in order to understand neurofield, I think it's really Im important to, to understand the basic assumptions that we've been creating uh, since 2007. Um, as we looked at this uh, technology, one of the things that we uh, found out that was that the brain would actually mimic the low-intensity stimulations that we put into it. And we conducted a uh, study with 21 subjects in which we put a QEEG cap on a person, um, obtained um, QEEG data, and then uh, stimulated the brain for 100 seconds and then took another EEG and compared the two. Now, when we looked at the group, all 21 subjects uh, 
pre versus post had no significant differences. Um, at first, we were kind of puzzled by this. Um, uh, when we looked at absolute power, coherence, and phase, there was no difference between the groups um, when we first looked into it. However, when we looked at each subject uh, specifically, there was significant differences. Uh, the problem was is that the brain changed differently for each specific person. So uh, the direction of the change um, w was not universal um, based on the type of stimulation that we gave. Um, so we couldn't um, find the difference between groups initially. However, when we decided to give a specific frequency and then test the groups, then we found that there was group differences. Um, and there are very significant uh, differences um, uh, in absolute power, coherence, and phase. What we found was that we could entrain the brain um, using electromagnetic stimulation and alternating current stimulation. Provided that the stimulation was not too strong, the brain will basically mimic whatever stimulation you put into it from roughly a very low frequency, below 1 hertz, all the way up to around 1,000 hertz. Um, when the brain gets stimulated uh, and the cells that get stimulated, they call for resources. And one of the things that we found was that capillary blood flow did um, increase as a result of the stimulation. Uh, we discovered this uh, through uh, taking uh, infrared pictures of the forehead pre and post stimulations, and we could see significant increases in blood flow. Um, as a result of increased blood flow, uh, neuroinflammation um, would be reduced. Uh, and this is a really interesting thing to find, especially with the uh, traumatic brain injury population that I treat. Um, when you get more blood flow into the system, free radicals get removed, the body can engage in its own process of elimination. Um, what we also found was that as these free radicals were removed from the system, uh, you would get uh, improved neurofeedback uh, responses. Uh, they could um, respond quicker because there was less um, obstruction, so to speak, in the brain. The other real good thing about neural field stimulation is that electromagnetic and direct current, alternating current, can be given at a high frequency. Um, and what I mean by that is you can give stimulations up to around 1,000 hertz uh, without damaging tissue or creating excessive heat. Uh, this is very important, obviously, because uh, we don't want to do any harm. Um, as long as stimulation is, is at a low level, it's safe. Now, the, the stimulation for direct current sti uh, stimulation and alternating current stimulation, random noise, is limited to a maximum of 2.5 milliamps. Uh, for the uh, electromagnetic stimulation, we do limit it at 50 microtesla. Those are uh, safe um, levels of, of intensity to apply to the brain without creating excessive heat. Um, the next thing we found was that the, the Procedures that we use appear to have a specific impact on uh, the default mode network, or what's known as the rich club. Um, the, the, research, the research regarding uh, the human connectome is uh, very significant in that um, when you actually apply EMF or DC or AC uh, current to the brain, uh, the rich club appears to um, alter itself and create uh, a new form of regulation, essentially. Um, and this is really fascinating stuff because, obviously, we want to get the basic foundation of the brain to engage in its own form of self-correction. Um, and we found that um, this really rhymes in with the current research that shows that the connectivity and phase dynamics do change uh, when we engage in this type of stimulation. So, where are we now? Um, let me take you uh, through the process that we've been going through uh, for the last several years. Rich Club Dynamics uh, um, are, if you, if you haven't re read this research, um, it r is really going to be beneficial to you, whether or not you use neurostimulation technology, in understanding how the brain actually regulates itself. 
Um, this is a basic outline of what um, uh, was found through the bold literature and the diffuse tensor imaging literature, looking at the connectivity of the biggest neuronal hubs in the brain. Um, when you sustain an injury, these hubs are critical in uh, getting back online. These, if these hubs are offline, the human brain has a significant problem being able to regulate itself. Um, I was sitting uh, listening to a lecture by Dirk DeRitter, um, who's a neurosurgeon. He talked about the Rich Club at length and basically um, looked at neurofeedback and said neurofeedback's uh, success rate will be greatly impaired if the Rich Club is offline and not communicating appropriately. And he specifically indicated that the posterior superior um, uh, cingulate is uh, one of the main players in um, Rich Club regulation. Um, this is another shot of uh, the Rich Club. And you can see the larger red balls there uh, are associated with large uh, neuronal hubs. And you can see that the majority of them are um, in the cingulate, anterior cingulate, posterior cingulate, hippocampus. Um, and these hubs are, are absolutely vital in uh, uh, regulation of the brain, which causes me to be more network-centric when I develop treatment plans using neurofeedback. Um, the literature goes on to show that uh, these, these specific hubs um, uh, extremely important when you look at uh, the treatment for a wide variety of uh, psychiatric problems such as depression, schizophrenia, um, bipolar disorder, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autism, hypoxia, ADHD. Um, there's, a, there's a wide variety of issues that are, are, that are hub specific. Now, over the years, uh, there have been different studies that have come out uh, that talk about uh, uh, how these uh, psychiatric problems are network-centric. And uh, I'm happy to share the, this research with you. Uh, if you're interested, you can back-channel email me, and I'll send you the studies. Um, but basically, these, these uh, disorders are hub disorders. Um, great uh, uh, majority of them are hub disorders. Now this is really important because um, obviously we want to get these hubs to communicate with each other. And um, when they're offline, they will continue to function. However, they won't communicate with the other hubs. And so the power and coherence and phase metrics will be extremely deregulated. And this is what we typically see in our QEEG data. So um, when we have a specific kind of problem, you can refer to these, um, um, this research, the, the, the study by Crossley is, is great because it really does show you which hubs get affected. Now the hubs can, like I said, they can, they can function internally and don't necessarily have to speak to the other hubs. However, when they do so, they take on a specific power and coherence and phase um, a uh, set of relationships that can be markedly different than the rest of the hubs in the brain. Um, when we engage in neurofeedback, of course, we're trying to get these hubs to speak with each other, and that when we get these coherent connections uh, to regulate themselves, the hubs appear to balance themselves in terms of power. But the real trick is how do you get the hubs to talk to each other um, when the coherence and phase metrics are so deregulated that they simply can't make the connectivity happen. Um, and this is where uh, neurostimulation comes in. Um, um, if we can get an uh, increase um, with uh, connectivity, then we start to see a regulation of the hub. Essentially what they do is um, uh, the power does balance itself. You start to see a overall power regulation across all the hub. Now, one of the ways that we we engage in this is by giving 
um, different kinds of neuro uh, cross-frequency coupling stimulation. Um, we started with this with electromagnetic stimulation, and now we've added alternating current to this theory. Um, by using so slow frequency carriers such as theta and delta, we can nest gamma um, and basically spread it across uh, the entire system. Um, traversing gamma across the brain is difficult all by itself because the bigger waveforms seem to impede it. However, when you um, engage in a harmonic coupling of, of, of theta gamma or delta gamma, then you can actually get these hubs to begin to communicate with each other and establish a better coherent and phase relationship between the neuronal hubs. Uh, we found with Neurofield that we can stack coils together and in one coil create a theta carrier and in another coil create a harmonically coupled gamma uh, frequency and have theta traverse the system. Well, gamma seems to be the thread that actually causes the system to communicate. Gamma appears to be um, uh, kind of the, uh, the magic thread, so to speak, that gets these hubs to regulate themselves and causes the coherence to change. There are studies that show that uh, theta gamma, delta gamma nesting can be associated with a memory task. And that um, I found this study to be very interesting because um, in a standard memory task where a subject was required just to remember numbers, um, for every number that they were asked to remember, another gamma chirp appeared. Um, and it was correlated to uh, um, short-term memory and your ability to remember basically seven plus or minus two pieces of information. So that um, uh, gamma is an emergent property uh, that occurs in the system and uh, does have a um, um, profound impact that I think we're just starting to understand. And again, I'm going to circle back to this and show you some data on how we're actually using this. So connectivity um, problems can cause the network hubs um, to assume different power ratios. And um, when that occurs, um, the system um, is not as functional as it can be. And that gives rise to a wide variety of different kinds of cognitive issues. Um, when you get a hypoperfusion in a system due to a concussion or a head injury or um, some type of insult to the brain that causes damage, um, you get reduced blood flow, which, which inhibits neurogenesis and inhibits the removal of uh, free radicals in that system. Uh, we have found um, that being able to increase uh, blood flow does remove free radicals. It does cause the system to uh, essentially uh, clean itself up and does give rise to increased blood flow and oxygen in that region, which is specifically correlated to neurogenesis. When we combined uh, the neurostimulation and neuromodulation uh, uh, techniques together back in 2012, we found that uh, we could regulate the systems much quicker simply by uh, promoting increased blood flow and um, uh, getting the network hubs to communicate with each other. Now recently we have um, uh, added specific types of uh, what we call current stimulation. Um, we, we utilize all these forms that you see right now, direct current stimulation, and it's real important to understand these types of stimulation because people commonly misunderstand. Um, with direct current stimulation, you're, you're placing two electrodes on the head. Um, and in direct current stimulation, there is no frequency. You're simply streaming electrons from the anode to the cathode. Um, and um, you do it at a specific intensity. Uh, but there's no frequency in, uh, associated with it. Direct current stimulation has been used for a long time, uh, specifically in Europe. They're way ahead of us in the use of this type of, of uh, uh, neurostimulation and been showing research for years showing the effectiveness of TDCS uh, on depression and on um, attention. Um, 
transcranial random noise stimulation is simply giving uh, a number of frequencies at a specific intensity, and it's very much like white noise. Um, for those of you that remember uh, back in the day when you're turning che TV channels and you caught one that didn't have any programming on it, you simply got a white screen, a hiss, and that's white noise stimulation, which is essentially random noise stimulation. Uh, the neural field system is capable of giving random noise all the way up from 0 to 4096 hertz and at an intensity of 0 0.001 all the way up to 2.5 milliamps. Um, imagine an entire uh, frequency spectrum uh, being fully populated randomly uh, all at once. Um, the difference is, is that TVs that you used to look at back in the 70s and the 60s that had random noise stimulation or ran a, a white noise essentially was a very low resolution TV. Um, the type of uh, white noise that we actually create now, uh, if you could imagine a 4000K uh, um, uh, TV um, that is capable of creating white noise on a real high resolution monitor, uh, we can do that now. Uh, Neurofield is capable of also giving alternating current. Now that's a frequency, and uh, you're, we can get frequencies from uh, 0 0.001 all the way up to 1000 hertz. We limited it. Uh, the frequency to 1,000 hertz because um, uh, we didn't want to create uh, too much heat. And um, there are specific rules about um, how much heat you, you can create before actually creating uh, um, uh, or damaging a cell. So we don't want to do that. Um, pulse uh, current stimulation is just like uh, alternating current, except you're giving a small pulse for a period of time and shutting it off and then pulsing again. Alternating current is continuous, where pulse current is not continuous. And the system is capable of, of creating all of these types of um, forms of stimulation. Um, we can deliver alternating current in, uh, with a sine wave, with a triangle wave, and with a square wave. Same with the pulse current stimulation, and same with electromagnetic stimulation. Now, it's really important to um, ask the question regarding safety. Um, there are a number of studies that look at uh, the safety of uh, direct current stimulation, alternating current, random noise. And um, uh, this study is a really good one because it does show how um, uh, safe the, the technology is, provided that um, the stimulation is not given for too long. Um, that it is not given at too high of an intensity, and that it doesn't promote too much heat. So um, the, the bottom uh, point there is really the takeaway from this uh, meta-analysis, which looks at um, uh, the effect of DCS. And it says it hasn't uh, produced any reports of serious adverse effects or irreversible injury across 33,200 sessions in 1,000 subjects. Now, the takeaway there is, is you need to do less than 40 minutes of that kind of stimulation, less than 4 milliamps, and less than 7.2 C of a uh, heat increase in the brain. Uh, with the Neurofield system, uh, we have found that clinical efficacy occurs between 20 and 30 minutes of stimulation, um, and we have capped out the system at um, uh, 2.5 milliamps, so we're less than the 4 milliamp uh, maximum that should be given. And of course, if you're that low of intensity, you're not going to increase the brain by 7.2 C, uh, which would be a lot of heat. Um, and again, this is really important uh, because um, some people think that more is more in giving neurostimulation, for instance. Um, uh, when you look at electroconvulsive uh, therapy, um, a, a, a stimulation of 800 milliamps is given to the brain, 800 milliamps, uh, in order to evoke a seizure uh, so as to reset the system, um, which is continued um, uh, use here in the United States. Um, and there's still literature saying that that is an effective mode of treatment. So at 2.5 milliamps, we're pretty confident that we're not uh, damaging the system. 
Now, the first studies that really looked at um, what is happening with TDCS are, are very important. Um, because uh, just recently on the NeuroGuide list here, I saw a post that talked about, um, questioned um, uh, the effect of DC stimulation and uh, whether or not it can um, um, cause the brain to engage in a level of neuroplasticity so it can change itself. Uh, this study does show um, that uh, um, a nodal TDCS does provoke um, a increase in the membrane voltage um, as compared to cathodal TDCS, which decreases it. And this study was one of the studies that really did suggest that the anodal stimulation is excitatory, whereas the cathodal stimulation is inhibitory. Now, while this is true, I think there's much more associated with this. Again, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump into it uh, a little later here. Um, but evoked potentials are a um, uh, was kind of the first line of um, research that did show the uh, the impact of TDCS on the brain, which is very important. Um, there's studies that have been done that looked at um, uh, if evoked potentials were different in piece of people that suffered from depression, and indeed uh, it was found that evoked potential evoke potentials in people with depression is greatly inhibited uh, as compared to a, uh, a healthy control population. <clears throat> but what's really important here is that um, direct current stimulation does seem to have a significant impact on blood flow. And, um, and this is really great because um, in my office for years, we used um, uh, HEG uh, in terms of trying to promote frontal blood flow. Uh, but when a person sustains an injury on different parts of the brain, it was hard to use HEG anywhere else. Uh, if there was hair in the way, you couldn't uh, help to uh, you know, increase blood flow in that area. But uh, w what is shown in this uh, particular study is that the in between the anode and the cathode, um, uh, blood flow was significantly increased as compared to the rest of the brain. So um, if, there's a, if there's an area that you want to really activate, um, you simply uh, need to think about where you're placing your electrodes and um, get them in between uh, that, that area and blood flow will increase. Now, this is where it gets really um, exciting um, because uh, not only does uh, blood flow increase, um, but there's a number of different things that occur um, as a result of uh, using TDCS and ACS. Um, in this particular study, um, rats were, um, uh, there was a stroke induced into the rats, and um, the question was, um, can TDCS induce uh, neurogenesis? Um, we know that neurogenesis occurs as a result of increased blood flow, and um, so they would induce strokes in these rats and then use uh, TDCS, and they found that um, neurogenesis does occur, um, and it does occur more effectively as a result of using this type of stimulation. Now, of course, um, I'm very interested in that because we do treat stroke patients in my clinic. Um, this particular individual um, um, had sustained a stroke and lost the use of his right arm um, when we uh, first met him. And after giving him a series of treatments, uh, he was able to re uh, regain use of the arm. And of course, um, uh, there's one of my staff there giving him a high five as he came in. I asked him, how's the arm doing? And uh, that's, that was his response right there. Now, of course, we know that blood flow increases. Um, but recently, and 2016 was a great year for uh, neurostimulation uh, research. Um, when people ask the question, you know, how do you know what, what's actually happening here? 
the bold studies have been conducted to actually show us what's going on in the brain when we give a stimulation. Um, and in this particular study, and this is this is a really exciting one, um, calcium ion um, surges were detected um, uh, in in these mice um, after they were given a stimulation. Now, what's really important to see here is that the, this activation occurred at a 0.1 milliamp stimulation, and the activation of the calcium surging occurred globally, not just in the point where they actually gave the stimulation, but across the entire system. And more importantly, the calcium ion activation was seen in the astrocytes, in the glia. And again, the glia is the glue that holds these cells together. And when you actually get a calcium ion activation in the glia, it gives rise to neuroplasticity. It gives rise to a decoupling of the system so that it is malleable. You can change it when this occurs. Now it's found that the neuroplasticity state actually sticks around for roughly one hour after you give this type of stimulation. So um, this is what caused us to uh, treat our stroke patients with a short amount of DC stimulation followed with uh, 19 channel Z-score neurofeedback. Um, and what we were able to do was to restore functionality in these portions of the brain that had been damaged simply by getting the brain to engage in its own process of regulation. Well, again, and this is really exciting stuff because in the past, one of the biggest limitations in neurofeedback was um, when the brain was damaged and we couldn't get blood into that region. We couldn't... Um, get the brain to be able to clean up its own garbage from, from, the, from the damage. And, and we couldn't help to increase the amount of neurogenesis in a way that would be um, uh, reasonable and, and help a person to engage in um, uh, the process of regulation. So again, this is a really important study. But there's more. Um, uh, and again, this is research that I'm happy to share. Um, now, not, not only does the system uh, respond to DC and AC and RNS stimulation, EMS stimulation, but that the, um, the current stimulation can actually change the connectivity of the Rich Club. And it was found in the bold studies that the Rich Club would actually change in almost one specific stimulation. Now imagine doing a series of stimulations over a period of two weeks. You can imagine what type of regulation that you could actually evoke. And the study is, um, is really powerful here because what you're seeing is that the, uh, the stimulation would actually evoke a 10 hertz um, uh, response in the brain that would um, override any slower peak frequency state. And again, this appeared to be global. Again, really fascinating stuff. So when you stimulate the system, it's attempting to regulate itself. It's attempting to create a peak frequency in the normal range, even in, even in the damaged areas. And this is what you can see in this particular uh, slide. Um, the bold research goes on to show that the rich club connectivity changes very, very quickly um, from a, a resting state uh, to a stimulation state. And you can see here in the, in the study how the scalp changes were recorded. Um, now there's, there's a good deal of, of literature showing um, that current stimulation can affect uh, a wide variety of different kinds of diagnoses. Um, the first thing that was really seen in the literature was the effect on depression. Uh, I was at a conference where um, I was presenting. I actually presented after this person, Dr. Liu from Australia, and she showed this research showing the effectiveness of uh, uh, DC stimulation given at 2 milliamps, 20 minutes a day, um, and they did 15 sessions uh, for three weeks. So you're getting uh, five sessions uh, a week. Um, and uh, what's really interesting about this study is that um, you can see how um, uh, there's, there's a direct 
um, there's, a, there's a treatment condition and then there's a sham condition. And in the treatment condition here, you can see that the, in, that's denoted in, in the red squares there. Um, that's the 2 milliamp um, stimulation. Um, and you can see that the, there's a significant uh, decrease in the Montgomery depression rating scale. Uh, in the sham condition, you can also see that there is a decrease in um, a person's um, reporting of their symptoms of depression. Now, here's what's really fascinating about that. The sham study was given at 0.5 milliamps. It was thought that at 0.5 milliamps, that wouldn't have any type of impact on the brain. Um, but what you do see here is at 0.5 milliamps, uh, you do get a reduction a significant reduction in the depression. Um, not as much as the 2 milliamp condition, but um, uh, you can give a significantly lower amount of stimulation and still get a clinical effect. And what we found was that you can give this stimulation and when you synchronize it with EEG neurofeedback, then you do get even a much larger effect. Um, Again, there's a good deal of research out there. This shows uh, bipolar versus unipolar depression, TDCS, twice per day for five days. And um, uh, bipolar subjects uh, uh, were on uh, uh, mood stabilizer. Uh, one of the questions that was asked was that would this type of stimulation cause a bipolar client to experience hypomania or a manic episode? And the answer is no. Uh, they didn't see that in, in um, uh, this treatment. But again, um, they did find the, sa the same kind of effect. The, uh, the sham condition as compared to the, uh, uh, to the treatment condition both yielded a reduction in the symptoms according to the Beck Depression. Inventory. Um, again, which is really fascinating, both conditions um, uh, were significant. Um, but again, you don't have to hit the brain with a really high level of, of, of stimulation in order to get it to change. You can do so uh, with low level stimulation. Now, TDCS has been around for a long time. And um, there's a great website um, called uh, totaltdcs.com. Totaltdcs.com. And um, where you can see more information about various montages to use with TDCS. Um, typically, um, for the treatment of depression, most people like to give a stimulation in between F3 and C3 with the anode, and they like to drop the cathode over FP2 or F8. Um, uh, we have seen, uh, we have tried that with very good success uh, for ADHD, F3, F4. Um, also, FPZ to OZ or FPZ to CZ. So there's a, there's, there's a lot of different ways of placing anodal and cathodal stimulation. And we base the placement of our montages, of our electrodes, um, on the QEEG data and the way somebody is actually presented. We have much more information than the standard um, stimulation uh, community uh, a lot of this is used as a canned approach, but when you utilize QEEG data and you target um, pathological or deregulated um, phase and metric uh, phase and, and coherence um, uh, metrics, uh, you can be much more specific in changing the overall uh, response in a person very, very quickly because we can target it. <clears throat> um, there are studies that talk about the improvement of um, cognitive uh, training. Uh, with again, with a lot of this has been done with uh, adults, but there's also been studies done on children, and that the um, uh, this study shows how the uh, there's an improvement in the cognitive training task. And again, what's interesting is that the sham condition uh, shows a significant increase as well. And again, the sham condition is based on the same type of logic, which says that 0.5 milliamps isn't really going to do anything when, in fact, it does. And I think that's a real important uh, takeaway here because in a lot of cases, people really think they have to bomb the brain. You don't have to. Um, alternating current stimulation, 
um, you know, one, one of the questions that people ask frequency, uh, frequently is, you know, can alternating current stimulation entrain the system? And how long will it train it, entrain it for? Well, the answer is yes. Um, alternating current can entrain the system. Um, and that if you do repeated exposures, uh, you'll get a stronger entrainment. Um, and these studies show that um, the alpha frequency can be entrained um, and that uh, it can um, uh, stick around for quite a bit of time. Um, and when you do um, synchronize this with EEG neurofeedback, you can teach the brain how to increase a specific frequency. Now, with Neurofield, we don't just focus on alpha frequency. We're going to use our QEEG to target the frequency that is uh, uh, deregulated. So if we have a person with an anxiety disorder that has too much high beta and a deficiency in delta, we can give delta and entrain the brain to actually create more. Um, this is actually very helpful prior to starting neurofeedback. So you can prime the system, increase the power of the specific frequency that is that is deficient, and then engage in EEG neural feedback so as to strengthen that entrainment. Now, there's um, uh, there's a number of studies that talk about um, giving a, a specific frequency around the alpha peak frequency um, so as to increase the alpha peak frequency. Um, and, and what's really fascinating about these studies is that you can give a frequency, provided that it's at low enough intensity and below the membrane potential of a cell, um, you'll actually amplify what that cell is actually giving. So if we have somebody that uh, we want to actually increase a peak frequency of, of alpha, we can give them 20 hertz and... Um, and hit the harmonic at a very, very low level of, of stimulation uh, of amplitude around maybe 0.1 uh, milliamps, and you'll actually see the uh, 20 hertz um, uh, peak frequency increase. The harmonic will actually increase. Um, this goes a long way in strengthening a normal peak frequency alpha. Uh, somebody has a really slow peak frequency alpha, it's a way to enhance it and actually speed it up. Um, again, there's, there's a number of studies that talk about uh, neuronal entrainment with ACS, and, um, and, and really it, it's not a question about um, does it actually entrain um, the brain. Of course it can do that. The real question is what is the period of time in which the entrainment actually sticks around and lasts? Um, um, and we're still asking that question now. Um, but we are relatively sure that the window of opportunity after a, the first immediate stimulation is roughly uh, one hour to two hours. Um, you can open up the system pretty quickly, and it will maintain that entrainment for a period of time. And this is extremely important when you're attempting to engage in neurofeedback stimulation. Uh, the level of entrainment is um, slightly higher than a what would be considered a sham condition. And again, uh, the sham condition isn't really a sham condition. Sham condition is, it really should be called a lower intensity stimulation condition. Um, uh, because what we have found uh, is that the amount of alpha stimulation isn't that much below um, the actual treatment condition. It's lower, but it's not that much lower. But there is a significant difference between the two. The point is, is that you can get those between both conditions. Um, the functional connectivity of, uh, of the ACS stimulation um, can be enhanced when you actually give a gamma stimulation. And uh, we have uh, engaged, we have taken our cross-frequency coupling theory and applied it to uh, alternating current and electromagnetic stimulation. Whereas we give a, uh, we create the theta carrier, the slow frequency carrier with electromagnetic stimulation, and then we, then we give an alternating current stimulation via the electrodes. We synchronize them so that they are harmonically coupled and that theta can be a 
a carrier, a cross-frequency coupling carrier. Um, and this gives rise to um, uh, um, increased connectivity in the Ridge Club and can help the most um, significant neuronal hubs in the brain to start communicating in a more functional way. This gives rise to um, um, uh, better functionality in the person and a decrease in symptoms. Now, um, transcranial alternating current stimulation is, in my opinion, really powerful and very effective. However, um, there are wrong ways to use this type of technology, just like in every other form of technology. Um, this particular study was used, um, and it's my example of what not to do in using alternating current. In this particular study, um, there was a, uh, a patient with epilepsy being treated with alternating current. Unfortunately, the uh, investigators decided to give a alternating current frequency at uh, 3 hertz. And um, they were thinking that if they were able to give a stimulation in the, uh, the seizure threshold range, that somehow or another it would actually um, uh, decrease the amount of seizures. However, what they found was that the seizures actually increased. And I think we could have told them that prior to uh, um, the actual use of alternating current. Um, you never, ever give stimulation in the delta or theta range with alternating current with somebody that has epilepsy or a seizure disorder because you'll add energy to that waveform and you will entrain it. You will actually make it stronger and give rise to more seizures. Um, the way to treat seizures is to give stimulation uh, in the high beta or beta range so as to directly disentrain or, or, or train out the amount of slow wave activity. Alternating current has been shown in the research to be an entrainment method. So it's important to understand that the, uh, uh, the stimulation can be used in a number of different ways so as to uh, train out aberrant uh, waveforms. Um, in patients with epilepsy, I like to give either 19 to 25 hertz or uh, somewhere in the uh, 15 to 19 hertz. Now, one of the other things that we've been using, and again, this is, this is really, really powerful stuff, is random noise stimulation. Um, random noise stimulation has been shown in the research to um, uh, desynchronize or decouple the brain. Um, because when you're giving, uh, for instance, in neurofield, you can give uh, a dynamic range from 0 to 4,096 hertz. And you can give it simultaneously, and you can give it randomly. So imagine giving everything from um, 0 0.001 milliamps all the way up to 2.5 milliamps, and from 0 0.001 hertz all the way up to 4,096 hertz, all at once, all randomly, filling the entire frequency spectrum. Um, when you do that, um, the system will become destabilized. And that destabilization will decouple the system and put it in a state of um, neuroplasticity. We know that through um, this research that we have here uh, and also through the direct current stimulation research. <clears throat> okay. Now one of the cool things that we're looking at now is called stochastic resonance. And um, I'm really fascinated by um, this idea um, we want to uh, get the brain to increase a specific stimulation. For instance, let's say we want to increase 15 hertz of alpha, or if, uh, beta, for instance. Um, we can give a stimulation at such a low intensity so as to actually increase or induce action potential generation um, and, and get it so that um, it will actually amplify the existing frequency in a cell. Um, we're playing around with this now, and we find that because we can go at such a low intensity, the brain will utilize that energy, and it uses it on a molecular level. Um, and we're, we're, we're really excited about this. More to come about this as we gather more research. 
Random noise stimulation has been shown to have a significant impact on um, tinnitus. And uh, Dirk de Ritter has done a number of studies uh, looking at tinnitus um, uh, and looking at the difference between direct current stimulation, al alternating current stimulation, and random noise stimulation. Uh, they looked at um, uh, the loudness of tinnitus and the annoyance of tinnitus. And they found that random noise stimulation did reduce the amount of, of, of both significantly. And we have replicated this in my clinic. I've had multiple patients come in with tinnitus, and uh, in a single session, we can drop that, that um, tinnitus level uh, significantly. And some patients have even reported that it stops for periods of time. Um, the real trick in this is, again, being able to deliver the stimulation on a consistent basis. And there needs to be a course of treatment and not just a single session, because it will come back after a single session. Uh, but if you give a course of treatment, you can reduce it and, and keep it down, provided that uh, there's no other insult to the brain. Um, so we, we have tried a number of uh, different tests to look at um, the effect of uh, uh, random noise, alternating current, DC, and EMF with synchronized EEG. And I developed this model back in 2012 and have built it and increased it over time. Um, now, with our Neurofield 64 platform, we can do 19 channel Z-score synchronization. We can also do old, what I call old-school amplitude training uh, that is synchronized with the stimulation as well. Um, we, the real-time Z-score method is one where we actually give a stimulation at a specific frequency uh, for X amount of time. And then we stop the stimulation, and then we take EEG, and we measure and train uh, the person for a period of time, uh, like 32 seconds or 16 seconds. And then, we, uh, then we, we crunch the numbers and we see whether or not the brain actually fell within the normal range uh, based on the z-score uh, thresholds that we set. And if the brain's doing that, then we actually um, give the same stimulation again. If not, then we modulate the stimulation and uh, we try another frequency until we find a lock and key effect to help the brain to regulate itself. So we've tried a number of ways of, 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 of looking at this. And in this particular study, um, we used an alternating current 19-channel EEG neurofeedback. And we wanted to look at the, uh, I was looking at the calcium ion uh, theory here. If we in, induced a uh, um, uh, calcium ion surge, um, could we actually get the brain to uh, change its connectivity, change the way that it's actually functioning? And um, this is what I'm going to show you here is a single session. Uh, we gave 0.1 hertz um, uh, stimulation at 0.5 million. And um, at 0.1 hertz, uh, we were able to give that stimulation while simultaneously doing 19 channel C score neurofeedback using NeuroGuide. Now, this is really cool because at 0.1 hertz, you're below uh, uh, the high pass filter so that the, um, uh, the EEG is not affected by the alternating current. It gets filtered out. And essentially, you can give both at the same time. Now, we ran five-minute rounds. And in between each round, we would stop the neurofeedback treatment and give 14 hertz at 0.5 milliamps for two minutes. And what you can see here is uh, this is a person that um, reported brain fog. Um, uh, con, you know, uh, concentration, tension problems, insomnia. And within 24 hours, uh, showed uh, significant improvements and better sleep. Um, and here's what the data look like. So on the left here is a, this is a Loretta uh, brain map. And you can see uh, on the left hemisphere here and the right hemisphere, but more on the left, you can see excessive slowing in the delta and theta ranges. Uh, you can see uh, where the brain is attempting to engage in compensatory methods with its um, uh, beta and high beta. Um, and on the map on the right, this is the next day. And what you see is, again, the, the, the amount of delta th theta <coughs> excuse me, and high beta uh, drops significantly within a 24-hour period of time. Um, 
So we ran a concussion index on the data. And this is really, uh, I like this slide because it shows um, what neurofeedback really is. And, and in my opinion, it's physical therapy for the brain. Uh, you're teaching the brain how to function differently. You're teaching it how to carve new pathways. Um, and the black line here on, on the left slide uh, is the initial assessment. That's where the person came in. And you can see it's smack dab in the middle of the orange there. Uh, and it's showing you that there's a moderate uh, score in the concussion index. Now, uh, the, the red line there is what the person looked like immediately after the treatment. Uh, their concussion index score actually increases into the poor range, uh, making the person look like they actually got worse um, after the treatment immediately. The blue line is what the person looked like the next day, uh, the next morning. And so what you're seeing here is a fatigue effect. Um, a person can get stimulated and the brain's going to get tired. And after you work out, you should be tired, uh, provided that you don't work over work out or over train. And we know from those of us doing neurofeedback training for a long time that if you overtrain somebody, you can cause them to regress. You don't want to do that. But you do want to, you know, uh, uh, significantly challenge the system so as to get it to um, to, to change, to regulate itself. And if the, the slide on the right is just removing that, that immediate um, uh, post-session response, and you can see that obviously there was a significant improvement um, in the person's functioning at the end of, of the treatment. And in my opinion, the executive functioning uh, change was the most significant change. Um, and you can see the, uh, how the network changed uh, from pre to post in the network history. Now here's a client with ADHD, 14-year-old uh, male, 10 sessions. And again, we're doing the same combination, neural guide, neural field combination. Um, and uh, with uh, neural field, we're giving alternating current at 0.1 hertz at 0.5 milliamps during the training rounds. And we actually had the ACS electrodes on the mastoids for this particular case. And you'll see why in a minute. Uh, in between rounds, we gave 14 hertz for two minutes um, for a total of four neurofeedback rounds, 20 minutes total. We found that 20 to 30 minutes is, was a good amount of treatment time. Uh, it, it adequately challenges the system while not overtraining the person, which is a really uh, important um, variable to keep a track of. Uh, so here you can see the map on the left is what the person looked like uh, when we started. And you, obviously, I want you to focus on the delta theta um, columns here. And you can see how uh, obviously there's, there's a theta uh, excess uh, in the frontal lobe, uh, the right frontal lobe, all, going all the way back to posterior and occipital uh, theta being significantly increased three standard deviations above the norm. Um, you also see um, uh, hypercoherence here as, as, as well and um, phase deregulations. Um, and, and, and here you can see on the map on the right how um, there's a significant drop in the, uh, the amount of theta activity and the coherences seem to have uh, resolved themselves uh, quite effectively. Um, now, de delta does, uh, does decrease quite a bit, but uh, what we found with this person is that they regulated quite, uh, quite nicely and that the level of attention did improve uh, quite a bit. And we did measure IVA scores uh, using the Integrated Visual Auditory Continuous Performance Test. <clears throat> um, here's an eight-year-old male. 24 sessions of the neural guide neural field combination. Again, the same methodology as uh, the last two uh, that you've seen here. Um, and uh, again, the, the same amount of rounds given 20 minutes total. Uh, this is not one of my cases, which is really great because uh, I like to see other people replicating uh, the methods. And um, not all types of ADHD are the same. Uh, some people have excessive slowing in ADHD. And some people have excessive uh, fast wave or high beta activity. Um, 
which is why I think the portal of entry for evaluation of ADHD should be conducted with QEEG evaluation, uh, simply because this is the kind of case where you do not want to give a stimulated medication. Stimulant medications would shoot this particular child off the face of the planet. Whereas in the previous case, a stimulant medication probably would have worked for that particular case because they had excessive slow wave activity. Uh, but you can see how the brain regulated itself over uh, uh, the course of treatment. And uh, by the end of it, um, coherence was uh, markedly changed and phase relationships improved significantly as well. Uh, this is the Loretta maps for this particular individual. Uh, again, uh, you can see how uh, the brain did uh, markedly change. Uh, and, you know, I really like, like I said, I think this is um, a significant evidence showing how um, alternating current stimulation can change connectivity, can change phase and, and coherence relationships, and that um, that gives uh, the neurofeedback capabilities uh, much more power and effectiveness. So here, um, this is where we're looking at schizophrenia. Um, getting schizophrenic clients to engage in neurofeedback is not easy, especially the paranoid type. Um, and we have treated some here in my clinic. Um, and again, it's very, it's very difficult to get them in because of the level of paranoia and discomfort that they experience. Um, but when we could get them in, we found that schizophrenia appears to be a rich club problem. Um, when the rich club is, is deregulated, it seems to give rise to more uh, significant symptoms of schizophrenia. And if you look at uh, the EEG brain maps, you'll see in a large uh, amount of, of this population, the anterior cingulate uh, in the frontal lobe is deregulated. Now, um, this is not one of my cases. This is another practitioner, a 50-year-old male, uh, chronic schizophrenia, 28 sessions of the neurofield neural guide combination. Uh, again, this is the um, uh, same procedure uh, that I've been talking about, the 0.1 stimulation during the training, 14 hertz in between rounds. Um, this guy really improved nicely. Um, he ends up uh, getting a job. His social interaction improved. But if you look at the map on the far left there, look at the theta column, and you can see um, the theta excess, and it's right over that anterior cingulate. Um, and look at the alpha column, and look at the coherence. Um, when you see coherences like that, that is a coherence, uh, a hypocoherence deregulation, and it's right over the rich club. The rich club is not communicating in the anterior cingulate and the posterior cingulate. And one of the things that um, I've come to agree with, uh, Dirk DeRitter indicated that the, when the posterior cingulate is deregulated, it can off-balance or, or deregulate um, other systems in the brain. And neurofeedback effectiveness can be greatly limited uh, if the posterior superior cingulate is uh, deregulated. And as you can see, as treatment progressed with this particular individual, um, that the brain uh, uh, did regulate itself, the amount of theta uh, decreased, and by the third map on the far right here, the, the hypocoherences had um, changed significantly as well, uh, along with a drop in that theta activity. What's really interesting is that this guy went out and got a job on his own. Um, his family had no idea that he did it. He disappeared for a period of time, and then uh, uh, they realized that he had uh, on his own volition, decided to do that, and it's because he was feeling good enough. And that's saying something. Here's a 13-year-old male diagnosed with ADHD, no meds, uh, no history of head injury. Um, uh, this particular, uh, or female, I'm sorry, um, this particular um, a client had a very, very unstable family system. Um, brother was abusive. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we gave 15 sessions of random noise stimulation uh, and then all, uh, electromagnetic and synchronized uh, EEG using our new platform, Neurofield 64. Um, we gave, uh, we pre-tested uh, and found that, um, that there was significant auditory attentional issue um, and that 
um, from pre to post, uh, we went from moderate severe to mild um, attention problems. Uh, this person, uh, you know, the parents were the first ones to see the change, uh, was more emo emotionally available, uh, her grades improved, and she started to paint. And, and this is what uh, the data looks like uh, from pre to post. <clears throat> and what's really interesting here is that uh, obviously you can see the theta excess in the posterior, uh, in central posterior and occipital lobes. Uh, and more importantly, you can see how the phase lag um, was significant as well. Um, and by the end of treatment, now, this doesn't look perfect, but there are significant changes here, especially in theta and in phase five. Um, and this person looked much more aware, much more focused, and uh, performed much better in school. Now, I'm fortunate in my clinic, I get a wide variety of patients. And um, this is a person um, diagnosed with a um, 67-year-old male diagnosed with Parkinson's. Um, he is stabilized on elbow dopa and carbidopa, but there's still severe tremor and, and rigidity. Uh, he loses uh, uh, balance easily and uh, when he came in and um, uh, had uh, significant problems with sleep. The rigidity uh, with this kind of population tends to influence their sleep significantly. Um, I was really concerned about this guy when he came in because um, when you get that weak and you get that rigid and tremor is out of control and the meds are at a level where it's, it's not safe to increase them much more, uh, there's not much more that can be done for the person. Um, so with this individual, we gave um, uh, DC uh, stimulation. We used two units, uh, two DC units. In Neurofield, you can actually use up to four stimulation units, two, e two EMF and two stimulation units simultaneously. So we use one DC and we, we put the anode on FP1, connected the cathode to O1, and for the other unit, FP2 to O2. We gave 10 minutes of stimulation at 1 million. And then we gave uh, alternating current and the EMF simultaneously using a delta gamma uh, cross-frequency coupled protocol for 25 minutes. Uh, after five sessions, uh, there was a significant difference in this person. And here's the maps. Um, when you look at this theta and alpha power, obviously um, that's quite deregulated. Um, and, but what really is significant here, if you look down the theta column, look at the coherence here. And look at this um, hypercoherence of the frontal lobe and hypo in the posterior lobes. And it goes, the, this, this type of problem goes right down the motor strip um, in a significant phase lag. Uh, and in five sessions, what we were able to do was break that apart um, and help the brain to regulate itself quite quickly using neurostimulation. Um, and again, uh, this is testing the calcium ion theory, which we think is, is markedly more significant. If, if calcium ions are surging, then uh, it, it, it goes to show that other ionic proper, properties are probably affected. Uh, the TDCS research for um, athletes suggests that no, uh, sodium ions are uh, so sodium ion channels are increased as well in the motor cortex. So we think there's a lot to the actual stimulation. Here's this person's um, uh, um, Loretta maps, and again you can see uh, the significant change over a period of five sessions. Um, and significant improvement. Rigidity went down, tremor went down, sleep improved. Uh, he's an ongoing patient. We're going to continue to work with him for a while. Uh, and I would say that um, I don't know if we're going to be able to stop the progression of a progressive disease, uh, but we certainly can slow it down. And that's, that, that increases his um, level of functioning and his quality of life. Here's a female uh, with severe hypoxia, <clears throat> and um, she suffered uh, from a hypoxic injury as an infant. She actually got stuck in her crib and got choked out um, from the bars on her crib, unfortunately. She was found um, unconscious and um, suffered from a severe um, uh, head injury as a result of the hypoxia. Um, she came to my clinic. We did a two-week intensive. 
And uh, when we do these intensives, we see a patient twice a day, and uh, we, we collect uh, EEGs three times during the intensive, one at the beginning, one at the halfway point, and one at the end. Um, we gave on the first week uh, electromagnetic stimulation and random noise, and then on the second week we gave electromagnetic random noise and neurofeedback synchronized. Um, her response was quite significant. She became more alert, she concentrated better. Her mother was with her and um, noted that she was uh, communicating better and um, um, engaging her in a way that she had before. Uh, the mother was quite impressed with uh, what we had done. This is the kind of case where hypoxia like this and somebody that has sustained it so long ago, this is a long-term case. This is somebody that would need quite a bit of treatment in order to uh, get them to uh, um, a higher level of functioning. But I think uh, uh, this is proof of the pudding that even uh, an old injury can be addressed. Um, here is the uh, spec scan from this particular individual. And uh, what we see here is hypoperfusion along with uh, the specific region where the spec scan shows a hypoperfusion. Um, uh, was significant because we end up seeing it in the brain maps. And um, here's the actual um, three QEEGs that we took over uh, the period of two weeks. And on the Q on the far left here, you can see the um, significant deregulation in the system. Uh, in my opinion, when the brain is this damaged, uh, you want to start with the slowest and uh, level of, of, of slowest frequency you can uh, and, and kind of address the brain from a bottom-up perspective. So if you look at the delta um, frequency range, that was the first place that I chose to address. And you look down at the coherence here at C4, you can see how that's extremely deregulated, hypo-connected. Um, so we decided, like I said, to give this uh, first week with STEM only and uh, she received a total of nine sessions the first week. And then she had the weekend off. And on Monday morning, we took the second QEEG, which is the one you see in the middle. And what you can see here is that the hypocoherence did um, uh, shift significantly. And the amount of delta activity dropped quite a bit. Um, and of course, like layers of the onion, the next thing that pops up is um, a new phase lag um, uh, deregulation. And so we decided to address that as well. And so we started to stimulate her brain from front to back. <coughs> Excuse me. And by the end of that week, we are able to break up the phase like deregulations. And again, delta drops more, theta drops as well. Alpha is significantly different. Excuse me. Okay. All right. So uh, we've been applying this method uh, to a number of different people. Uh, here's a 39-year-old male, severe drug addiction, concentration, tension, depression, insomnia. He gets in a, uh, a car accident, and he, and he suffers from a severe head injury. Um, and the, the accident also affected his gut and he ended up getting sepsis while he was in the hospital. Um, we've given him a total of 35 sessions. The last 15 were TDCS, EMF, and RTZ with Neurofield 64. Again, this is the synchronized method. Um, and uh, this guy had a great response to the treatment. Um, as you can tell, theta is deregulated globally along with um, significant delta increases. Um, as you can see from the, the phase and coherence, uh, there, there were significant changes. Uh, delta drops a lot, theta drops a lot. Um, he goes back to work and gets a job under the table. Um, he had been working as an um, electrician and uh, didn't want to come off a disability, so he, he was asking me not to tell anybody that he was getting better. Um, but his brain maps kind of tell the story all by itself. But obviously, his functional behavior is uh, a big difference as well. Um, we have found that neurostimulation can 
uh, change coherences, it can change phase, and it can help the brain to regulate itself um, quite quickly. Um, when we couple neurostimulation with a synchronized EEG neurofeedback uh, modality, we can indeed um, help the brain to regulate itself much faster. And it is my opinion that we're going to be able to go deeper with this with better procedures um, in the future. Um, but uh, right now, the, the data is moving in the right direction, in my opinion. All right. And that's the basic part of my presentation here. Um, I'm willing to take some questions here for the next 15 minutes and see what we can do here. All right. So, If you want to ask questions, go ahead and type it, uh, that you want to ask a question, and I can open up uh, your microphone. I see one from Leo here. Isn't the dehabituator a form of white noise? Um, no, it's not. Um, the dehabituator is giving four channels of, of random stimulation simultaneously, but it's nowhere near the amount of frequencies that's being generated in the random noise stimulation. Um, the random noise stimulation is, in the hardware, we built 16 random noise generators that kick out um, thousands of frequencies simultaneously. And so uh, the amount of frequencies and amplitudes that's being generated in, in TRNS is so much more increased and so much more significant than the uh, uh, than the uh, dehabituator that uh, there really is no comparison. Now you can run the dehabituator with um, uh, random noise stimulation simultaneously. Uh, there is a way to do that in Neurofield 64, and on the website there's a video. Um, we have, you know, there's a video talking about how to actually do that. Um, okay. Let's see. And Jerry DeVore asks, uh, we have been addressing clinical problems. What about this technology for meditation and optimal functioning? Absolutely. Um, we have used it with meditators. Um, the, uh, we, we have developed a alpha, theta, um, cross-frequency coupling protocols and use it with meditators to enhance their meditation ability. Um, and so what we do, um, based on the work of Douglas Daly, um, I designed a alpha, theta, gamma uh, protocol um, that can be given for a period of 15 minutes and then stop. And then from there, um, uh, we engage the person in alpha, theta, uh, gamma neurofeedback training. And um, their level of meditation has improved quite a bit. Uh, we've used it with athletes for peak performance and um, uh, in a number of different realms. Uh, I've tre I've tre I, I live by Mammoth Mountain, which is a, uh, a high altitude a ski resort. And um, in, uh, I've worked with snowboarders and professional skiers, and uh, we've been able to enhance their ability uh, by using alpha, theta, gamma uh, treatments. And really, it's, it's a way to, you know, it's, it's another regulation technique. And these particular individuals don't have a, um, a form of pathology. We're just enhancing what they're already good at and helping them to get in the zone more. Uh, but we have a number of, of different cases where um, that has been shown to be pretty effective. Okay, Andrew asked the question, when you say that entrainment sticks around for one to two hours, can you clarify this and why not longer? All right, so the research says right now, the bold research says that when you stimulate the brain, um, uh, what they, they were able to monitor basically for one hour and, and, and show that the calcium ion activation uh, continued to, uh, um, to increase and, 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 and 
can happen within that one hour window. Now, um, it may be longer, and my sense is it probably is longer, but the research right now says that the window is at least one hour. Um, and ag again, remember that the, um, uh, that the stimulation is going, you, you can apply it to one part of the brain and it will cause a global cascade. Um, that global cascade is going to affect the astrocyte layer. And that astrocyte layer is going to give rise to neuroplasticity. And again, calcium ion surges is going to um, uh, continue on for that period of time. Now, um, again, we don't know how long that is. Um, but one hour is really long enough, in my opinion, because if you stimulate uh, for a short period of time and then engage in neurofeedback immediately, you're within that window of opportunity. So it's, uh, it's probably longer, that's my opinion. And Wanda asks, what about long-term results? Um, right now what we're seeing uh, is we've done up to one-year follow-ups, and we have seen that the uh, results stick uh, regarding, uh, or, uh, you know, if, as long as there is no other type of insult uh, uh, associated with the brain. So typically, the amount of uh, stimulation can be um, uh, maintained over time. All right, Leo, can I share the references for uh, Douglas uh, meditation work? You know, um, sure. Uh, but you know what you can do if you want to get it immediately? Um, just Google Douglas Daily, EEG, and you'll go right to his website. Uh, Douglas has created uh, protocols for uh, BioExplorer. And where he does uh, alpha, theta, gamma uh, protocols, and you guys can obtain them directly from him. Uh, and he has the research there as well. So if you don't want to wait, you can get it the time I get to it. Andrew says, thanks. You're welcome, Andrew. Jennifer asks, what was the protocol for the last client, the addiction client? Um, let's take a look again. Uh, we did uh, 15 sessions of DC, EMF, and RTZ. Um, in this particular indiv individual, what we gave him was um, SMR. And so we, DC, we gave DC stimulation for uh, uh, a, just a short period of time in order to trigger the calcium ion activation. And then we changed it to ACS, and EMF, and RTZ simultaneously. And um, by giving, if you look at this map, you can see relative power in beta and high beta is extremely low. And so even though absolute power is within the normal range, you can give more of this um, SMR or low beta and, and probably get a pretty good response, which is what we see here. And, and you can see that even though we gave SMR, the amount of beta didn't um, uh, increase because the brain doesn't need to do that. Um, we just helped it along uh, using its own compensatory method. So, um, that's what we pretty much did. Okay. Let's see. Can I share re research on tinnitus? Absolutely. Yeah. And Dirk, if you, uh, if, again, if you don't want to wait, uh, um, Dirk DeRitter um, is the one that you want to Google. Um, he, has, uh, he has conducted studies on tinnitus showing um, that uh, random noise stimulation can be very effective in reducing uh, the severity. Um, what's interesting there is that the study that they um, uh, that they conducted used a device that could give random noise stimulation from basically uh, uh, one hertz up to 640 hertz, and they found that the 100 to 640 hertz level was more effective at reducing the tinnitus than the 1 to 100 level uh, of random noise. So they could actually set the range of, of random noise. Um, what's interesting here is that uh, the neurofield device can go way above 640 hertz. We, we actually set it to 4096 hertz. Um, when you give random noise at that range, you're actually engaging in a noise cancellation um, a scenario. And because um, if you can actually match the frequency of the tinnitus, you'll reduce it. And so uh, it's a noise cancellation theory. So 
we have been giving all the way up to 4,096, and a person may walk out um, saying that they, they, the tinnitus is louder for a period of time, and then all of a sudden it drops, and it stops for a period of time. Uh, the trick is, is is continuing to give the stimulation uh, over a course of treatment. All right. Can I spell it? Douglas Daly, D-A-I-L-Y, uh, Alpha Theta Gamma uh, treatment. Okay. <laughs> Right. And Christine asks, uh, will the recording be on the website soon? Yeah, as soon as we can get it out there, we'll definitely get it out there. Um, ah, uh, Heather posted the um, actual uh, website for, for Douglas Daly. His research is www.growing.com forward slash mind forward slash. Again, www.growing.com forward slash mind forward slash. Thank you, Heather. What would I recommend for persistent anhedonia? Hmm. It really depends on what we see in the map. Um, we can, you know, one of the problems with neurofeedback is people treat a diagnosis. And, um, and they don't treat the person. And so it's really important to get the data and to uh, uh, conduct a thorough history with the person and really zero in on what's happening with the person. Because a diagnostic uh, characterization of the person doesn't necessarily give you all the information you need to formulate a good treatment plan. You want to look at the person, look at their symptoms, look at the cue, match the data to the person. And that's really key. Alrighty. Are there any other questions? Looks like I've come to the bottom of the list. You're welcome, Jenny. Going once. Going twice. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate that. All right, folks, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope you have a great day. Um, we are going to have a Neurofield conference in July um, where we're going to have a number of speakers that are going to um, uh, present Neurofield data and documentation, and it's going to be in Santa Barbara, California, right after the 4th of July. Uh, and we're hoping that you intend uh, to come. The, uh, you can sign up online if you go to neurofield.com, look for the conference tab and click on it, and we'll get you online. Uh, we hope to see you there. And if not there, hopefully ISNR in September. All right, take care. Have a great day.